going to talk to you a little bit more about the election and kind of into the Italian media sphere and also disinformation, also raising some concerns for the current government um, and the relationship with Russia and the disinformation ecosystem. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, so the Italian media sphere is extremely interesting. Um, as you can see here, these are kind of the bigger names of the game. Um, it kind of goes without saying that it's kind of different to say us because this is a country where they speak Italian, not any other country speak Italian. Obviously in Malta, they do speak at some parts of Austria and Sw Switzerland, but this means that the ecosystem of information remains relatively small especially with their population. So it's not like us where we have access to English media and Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN. We have these options. The Italian media sphere impact is a lot heavier with it being smaller. Um, there is essentially no regulatory approach to the media sphere in Italy. Um, there is tight links between politicians and media organizations and the history of media mogul and former leader Silvio Berlusconi is the is a great example, an important example of this overlapping between the media and politics. Um, while digitization has allowed for some plurality of competitors, there's still great concerns um, to have when it comes to the Italian media and the way Italy is essentially becoming a gate for Russian disinformation into the European Union. So in Milan in particular, which is the northern city, um, it is home to many of the newspapers and magazines. Uh, most newspapers are privately owned and they're often linked to a political party or they're run by a large media group. Uh, newspaper readership in Italy, uh, it is quite low in comparison to other European countries. So this is where uh, television shows are actually very important, as well as social media. The biggest uh, social media is Facebook, and that's where a lot of people get their information. But a lot of people still rely on traditional uh, television for their news. Um, we have Rai and Mediaset. They are the dominating figures in the TV market, whereas Sky News, like so News Corp, Sky News Italia, is the paid TV sector. They dominate that sector. Um, Mediaset is the largest commercial broadcaster in the country, but it is owned by the former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi. The public broadcaster Rai has traditionally been subject to political influence. So when, for example, Berlusconi was prime minister, he was able to exert tight control over both the public and the private broadcasting. Um, so under law, under Italian law, speakers of the two houses appoint the Rai president. So Rai is state affiliated. It's connection, connected to the Economic Development Ministry of Italy. Um, and the president and the board of directors are appointed by the two houses. Um, in practice, the decision is obviously a very political one, uh, generally resulting in some opposition representatives becoming directors, but the top managerial posts go to people who are usually sympathetic with the government. It's quite normal to have two directors and a president belonging, belonging sorry, to the parliamentary majority, while the two other directors will usually be opposition supporters. Um, to break down the impact Berlusconi has on the media, he owns three out of seven of the national channels. This includes Canale Cinque, Italia Uno, and Rete Quattro. Uh, Reporters Without Borders actually previously called him a predator to threat uh, to press freedom. Um, and this was the first time that that kind of language was used on any EU leader. Um, it is also really important to note Berlusconi is a very good friend of Vladimir Putin's. The two have holiday together. They have a very close relationship. They've been photographed together, giving each other gifts. And this really has seeped into politics. Uh, so, for example, it took Berlusconi two months to publicly denounce Putin's war in Ukraine. And um, there's some questioning over this, whether it was just a political stunt to satisfy Europe ahead of the elections, um, because his stance does remain still very unclear. Uh, as he recently suggested that Ukraine should be open to Russian demands. Uh, Berlusconi continues to lead the centre-right Forza Italia, and uh, apparently, according to La Stampia, um, he met with the Russian ambassador on the day he withdrew the support for Draghi, which is something that he also denies. Uh, next slide, please. 
So essentially there has been a major underreporting of Italian language networks amplifying Kremlin disinformation. Italy is increasingly becoming this primary target for Russian propaganda in Europe. So there's been years long of pro-Russian sympathetic rhetoric, as well as anti-establishment disinformation, which has really primed a portion of the Italian audience to be very receptive to Kremlin narratives. Um, there's always been a very interesting relationship between Italian elites and Russia since the 60s and 70s. Um, Italy has no regulation of the Z, Z symbol, which is a propaganda campaign that sort of supports the war. And there was an investigation done by Deco39, which identified a network of a quarter of a million Italian language accounts on Twitter that were supporting the Z movement. And after studying and identifying these accounts, there was a huge crossover with anti-vax movements, which suggests that this is a complete coordination campaign. Um, there's also been concerns for many years over Italy's sympathy towards the Russian government which a majority of the concern has been towards the right-wing alliance, which has historically, for example, praised Russian maneuvers in Syria. Um, they've also called for sanctions to be lifted. Then we also have Matteo Salvini, who has sported Putin's shirts in the European Parliament previously and has called on Italy to not aid or give weapons to Ukraine. Um, there's also their formal alliance that they have with Putin's United Russia um, party. And despite you know, many condemnations of, of Russian military aggression, Salvini has only spoken Putin's name on very rare occasions, and he insists that there's still a diplomatic end to the war. Um, there's also an investigation citing intelligence reports by La Sampia, which says that Salvini's aid was um, apparently asked to withdraw support, um, although this has not been confirmed, this is citing intelligence reports. Um, and then you also have the important thing of there is Kremlin overt media that is targeting Italian audiences. Um, so the EU did ban Sputnik and RT, which is Russia Today, um, their Italian language sites in the, throughout um, Italy because of the EU law, but Unfortunately, it still has persisted. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so Sputnik Italia, actually their Telegram channel after the ban from the EU saw a huge uptick. So if you can see here, as soon as the war began, there's a big uptick of people who joined the Italian language Telegram uh, channel. Now, this is quite important because Telegram is different to any other sources because Telegram acts in kind of an echo chamber. You can't communicate back. You can't really comment. You can react. Um, but most of these, like, for example, Sputnik Italia, it is sending like a broadcast message that can't be reputed. Also, Sputnik Italia has this section on their website in the corner that says, if you are you having issues with reading Sputnik? And it tells instructions about how Italians can download the app and they can also join the Telegram channel. And the way it's worded particularly sounds like a, you know, we have sense, we're being censored. You need to come here. You need to listen to us. So it's very extremely misleading. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. And this is where the media gets very interesting and where it comes into that traditional kind of playing field is what every in intent to influence campaign needs to succeed is airtime and Italy gives it very generously. So since the beginning of the war, Italian talk shows have been a hotbed for manifesting pro-Russian misinformation. In May, Italian uh, talk show Zona Bianca owned by media set so Berlusconi um, hosted a foreign minister Lavrov and it was his first appearance since the invasion on Western media. The segment was 40 minutes long and essentially ex consisted of extreme blurting outs of Kremlin talking po points. So, for example, Bucha was staged, Russia is a peacekeeper. He even went on to say that Hitler was Jewish. Um, some may look at this and say, no, this is good, but you're not seeing really the severity here because this is not the right environment. Italian talk shows aren't known to fight back or to give hardball questions. And there was none of those questions here. There was no correction of any disinformation or misinformation or false information presented. It was all left there to the audience. And the presenter gave no questions or asked him to deny or to provide any evidence on any claims he gave. Even at the end of the presentation, um, 
the presenter, uh, Giuseppe Burindesi, he even wished Lavrov uh, bon lavoro, which is like good luck in your work at the end. Following this report and this uh, appearance from Lavrov, one prominent host on that same channel, Rete Quattro, he said that there was no, there was a massacre in Butcher, but he cannot say who did it. And he said that they're Nazis in Kiev. And he began a segment where he began to mirror what Lavrov was saying and continued to echo that there essentially was no um, uh, proof that Russia had done the atrocities in Butcha. But we know from satellite imagery and open source intelligence that this is incorrect. Next slide, please. Um, the same channel also invited Italian-speaking Alexander Dugin uh, for a primetime appearance. Dugin is known as Putin's, uh, pretty much the brains behind Putin is what many people call him. He's essentially wrote a book which many people point to as being Putin's motives and agenda. Um, he is staunchly against Ukraine and he was given a primetime appearance where the same thing happened. There was no fight back from any presenters and the disinformation was not corrected. Next slide, please. Similar thing happened here, La Sete, which is owned by Cairo Communications. They hosted Sedna, TV journalist Nadania. Um, this is a TV network that is owned by the Russian Mil Ministry of Defense. And Nadana spent most of her time on this program saying that Russia did not start the war and that Russia was defending Ukrainians. And again, this presenter offered no correction and no pushback for any disinformation narratives pushed. And the next slide, please. The Italian media also shared images that were full Russian propaganda, um, which were there to create the narrative that there were US bio labs within Ukraine. This image in particular is a fake image. It is from a video game called Blackout that was never released. So we had state media, Italian state media, as, as well as media set, so Berlusconi's media, as well as Cairo Communications. So these are your biggest channels, sharing this image, translating it also into Italian and giving it to their audiences. Um, La Siete was the only network to issue a correction about it. So Italian state media didn't do that, nor did media set. The journalists who spent a lot of time talking about this were going for a long time and there was no correction at all. Um, the same channels also uh, said that Ukrainian sabotage was behind the first attacks on the nuclear power points, and this was where tension was boiling, and this is very concerning. Uh, next slide, please. So as much as we're seeing it online, we're also seeing it offline, where there was potentially Russian in interference, um, and these are just allegations of the movement. So firstly, as going into this election, as for many European elections at the moment, it, the conversation was heavily around migration, um, this has been an issue, obviously, in Italy, Italy for a long time, and it has been a talking point amongst politicians. Um, as polit uh, politicians hit their political trail, there was, began to be reports of Wagner, which is a Russian private military group owned by an oligarch who is very close to Putin, of their involvement in destabilizing Italy with a migration influx. Um, it began circulating, as you can see here, by an article written by La Repubblica, um, there was an uptick in migrants that were all traced to a departure from a Wagner-controlled area of Libya, a port called Tobruk. Um, this is something that would help right-wing alliances as they can weaponize migration and in politics, and this is something that the Kremlin is used to. Um, they've interfered in European politics for years using a tactic of weaponizing migrants. We saw this in 2006 on the Finnish and Norwegian borders. Um, what this does is it really weakens the coherence across the EU and it sows discontent and deploys straight out of Putin's playbook. Um, there were also some allegations around some pop-up bars in across the country. So, for example, someone reported this bar, Bababari, um, they said it was in Venice, it was new, it was packed by locals, the drinks were dirt cheap, half price of anywhere around. So students and locals were going to this place. Um, the bartender was Russian, Italian, and apparently, according to some customers who spoke Russian from the Baltic countries, they overheard the bartender and a regular discussing their job, which was to persuade locals with Russian propaganda. So they were speaking about talking points they could give 
the Italian students who were coming to the bar, um, different topics such as the energy crisis that they would be able to discuss. Um, and they were talking about how they can shape the conversation uh, to the viewer or to the person they're with. Um, so it seems like this is a tactic that was used by Russia before, um, where they recruit workers in those countries who either speak the local language fluently or they are from that country, um, and they give them good salaries and help their business at the cost of following some instructions. Next slide, please. And um, to end, essentially, Russian propaganda has almost found this home in Italian media. Um, Russian propagandists and sympathists have found a home for themselves in Italian media and have a significant impact on the public opinion in that country. Italy, Italian TV has offered a judgment-free zone for close friends of Putin, for journalists who are involved and connected to overt media, as well as the defense ministry, um, despite the fact that there is a ban on EU and Sputnik, I'm sorry, RT and Sputnik in the EU. Um, this does raise questions to why government channels are allowing affiliated journalists to have an audience despite the ban. And uh, moving forward, a Russian tolerant um, Italy would undoubtedly cause a stir in Brussels, particularly as we have the conversation about the energy crisis and winter ongoing in Europe at the moment. There are a lot of questions moving forward for this government. So thank you.